and welcome back to the United 12 podcast, where we discover Christian testimonies and discuss how modern day Christians should view the world. So right before we start, we have a very special guest, but I just wanted to direct you guys. If you guys are enjoying the podcast, if you like what we're doing um, and you want to support us, just go ahead and go to united12.com. Then you're going to click on the podcast um, button and we actually have a patron account that you can help donate to us every single month or you can just click on the partner tab on united12.com and donate through paypal as well so that we can continue to make this podcast uh, commercial free and without any interruptions and and have guests on Um, so today's guest is very special he is a pastor at kingdom come church and his name is Jared Buffington. How are you, dude? I'm doing good, man. I'm glad, glad to hear it. So uh, it's a especially beautiful, wonderful, sunny day in Miami. How are you enjoying your day? I love it. It's just a little bit cold, so I just I love it, man. <laughs> right? It's like the best weather when it's uh when it's just like cold, like sunny and cold. Yeah, sunny and cold, man. I've been I'm missing nature lately. <laughs> but um, so, anyways, so. We have you on to talk about your testimony. Um, I understand that you have a really powerful, powerful testimony. Um, tell me a little bit about like when you grew up. Um, okay, and so and where I was born, I believe, right here in Hollywood, Florida, and I grew up in Aventura, and um, I, I moved for a little bit with my father, and my mother, but they got divorced super early. Like. I might have been two or three. Mm-hmm. They were divorced, so we were back here in Aventura, uh, living with my grandparents. So my mother, my grandfather, and my grandmother, and uh, we went to church. We, my mom even put me in the. My church had a school, so I went to a Christian school uh, for elementary and stuff. And um, it was like a paid Christian school. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because I guess she wasn't Fancy. paying rent. <laughs> yeah, so she was trying to put me in that that school, and uh, uh, yeah, just gr- growing up in church, and and I was real, um, I was different. Uh, we talked about a little bit that the the church and the school I went to was like all Caribbean, like all African American or all Hispanic, and I was one of like maybe two white kids in like the whole church, and it was a huge church, like mm-hmm. a mega church, like two thousand people, and one of the only white people there um, here in I, Hollywood. No, the the church was actually in Miami, like right off of um, I can't remember right now, but right in Miami, um, mm-hmm. it was it was called a place called Hope. Okay. Yeah. Okay, interesting. And um, what did you learn anything like in, in church when you were little? Like, did it captivate you at all, or was it just like, oh, I'm just doing this like, because my parents are, you know? No, I like I loved church. Like, I love church. I always wanted to go to church. Uh, we had this bishop that was amazing, mm. and he would do these movie illustrations with, like, the Lion King and the Matrix. <laughs> like, he was awesome. Like, so I loved hearing, and and looking back, I see how blessed we were because it was a church that was a part of the charismatic movement. Uh, they had the kingdom message, um, you know, so they were a lot different than even normal churches now. Um, so I loved hearing the preach and I loved all that stuff, but Jesus was not the Lord of my life. Um, even being around, you know, there's a difference between being around the presence of God and being submitted to the presence of God. Mm. Um, and just that lack of home life. I was so rebellious. Uh, even going to those private schools, I got kicked, like expelled from school every single year Mm. of my life until my mom made me homeschooled in sixth grade but why what were you doing (laughs) it was so bad i don't i guess um were you a bully (laughs) no i was not a bully i was too small to to really be a bully um (laughs) but i would get bullied i get bullied by older kids Mm -hmm. um and i just wanted to fit in so bad like Mm -hmm. i i don't know what was going on with my mom i think she might have been depressed or something so she she wasn't a bad mom she wasn't drink she wasn't abusive but i didn't like connect at home so I just felt so alone so I was trying to connect and older kids that are at church a lot what are they doing because we're inner city church they're cursing they're Mm. smoking they're doing all this stuff so I was trying to curse Mm. and I would just be outrageous and I saw how much attention I would get or they would laugh or they would maybe think that I was cool um so I was just trouble man Mm. interesting (laughs) all right and then what what happened like uh 
you, you became homeschooled at sixth grade? Yeah, so my, my mother got married when I think I was eight years old. Okay. Uh, to a great guy. He was a pharmacist. His name was Chris. Um, he's passed away now, but he was a great stepdad. Uh, I didn't know how bad stepdads could be. Um, but looking back, he was amazing because he tried. But he went from having no kids to having an eight-year-old rebellious kid, and he didn't know how to handle that. But we moved to Georgia because mm-hmm. he got a, a job, and it's cheaper to live there and stuff. So we moved up there, and um, yeah, I, I was just even more trouble. And in middle school in Georgia, I don't know if it's like that down here, but in middle school... You're cool, especially like in an urban setting. The cooler you are is based off if you're willing to fight or if you get in fights more. And again, um, I was one of the only white people, mm. <laughs> so I had to prove myself more. I was immediately outcast or uh, looked down on. So I was getting in so many fights and getting suspended. My mom pulled me out in the middle of sixth grade, and um, I was homeschooled. So f- all of middle school was homeschooled. Wow. I mean, we have that in common because I grew up in Carroll City. (laughs) Hey. So I was always surrounded by like, um, like black people. It was a Caribbean folk, uh, Jamaicans, you know, you name it. Like, but white people, there's no white people. Like I was, my mom was so scared to send me to like school because she thought I was going to like get killed. (laughs) I mean, back in the nineties, like this discrimination was like still happening. Yeah. So, um, like I was blonde and had green eyes and like and I was a little bit flamboyant. I was blonde too. Yeah. yeah. So like she's like, oh my gosh, they're gonna kill him. <laughs> they're gonna kill him. At I had a bowl school. cut. Picture like nineties and early two thousand. I had a bowl cut. I had I a bowl just... cut too. <laughs> Dawson's Creek man. <laughs> Stupid bowl cuts. But yeah, we have that in common. So I know what that feels like. I had to kind of like mature. I had to. Um, I had to understand how to um, navigate my my circumstances. Mm-hmm. So like, I had to learn how to fit in. Um, I had to learn how to like shut my mouth, and I had to either like submit or be rebellious. So it was like either like I'm gonna like just like stay here in a little corner, or like I'm gonna break out. You know, mm-hmm. which is kind of like two different sides of the opposite. Like I like submitted, and you were like, yeah, I was like break out, <laughs> break out. So okay, so then um, when you became homeschooled, you stayed homeschooled throughout high school as well. No, um, so we moved to uh, Georgia, and my cousins, because because I have a like a family lineage of ministry. My my great grandfather, he was roommates with Billy Graham. Oh, he was wow. a part of like the beginning of the charismatic movement. Like he got kicked out of the the Southern Baptist Convention for speaking in tongues and stuff. <laughs> and uh, his son, Don't you just love Baptists. <laughs> love it, love it. Anyways, uh, his son was a minister. And uh, my grandmother was in ministry, so we had this kind of family line of ministry. And, and so my uncle and my cousins, which are like close to my age but a little bit older, they were going to this church. So my mom said, well, we'll bring him here. He liked church in South Florida. Maybe we'll do there. But church in Georgia was so different than how I grew up because down here, the church I was going to was kind of like cutting edge with the arts. Like they were one of the first churches. They had rock and roll and instruments in the church. When I was growing up, they let the kids do the hip hop dance and performing arts and comedy and rap and all that this, was here. all this stuff in Miami, mm-hmm. um, which drew a big crowd. But in the midst of that, a lot of people were coming but not getting saved. They were just there. But a, a lot of powerful stuff happened. But mm-hmm. up there, church was not like that. It was like Bible Belt. Mm-hmm. It was like just traditional. Yeah, just way different yeah. than down here. But my cousins were there. So I got involved, and I was super passionate about church there, but I still had this rebellion and, and stuff like that. And we, But God actually moved, and there was like a revival that happened at that mm. church. It was when I was in like seventh grade. And mm. all of the schools in my county, which isn't saying much for the county, <laughs> but all of the middle schools, all of the high schools, and then kids from all of the middle schools in the next county over all started coming to this youth thing, and people were getting saved and people were getting amped up because they used to let kids skate in the parking lot <laughs> and stuff like that. Hey, we'll tell you about Jesus, but you can also skate in the parking lot. You can lot. skate in the parking lot. And they, they let like us have like alternative rock worship music and stuff. And um, that like really impacted me and kind of watered more of the seeds. But I was just like rebellious too. And, and I had this youth pastor. He invested a lot in me because I was homeschooled, so I'd go meet up with him. And I did a comedy sketch 
in the youth, like a comedy show bit that was a part of the regular youth. And at a certain point, he said, okay, you got to take care of it on your own because I can't keep coming up with it for you. And I took that as rejection again. Hmm. I took that as being left out again. So I just... What do you re- mean take care of it of your own? Like-, like, like he was like, okay, so now you plan the skits. Like you... Oh. You plan it. So, because I'm going to focus more on the worship and more on like raising up leaders and stuff. And uh, I just took that as rejection. And I became like the greatest enemy of the whole thing. I was like heckling the person that replaced me. I was like making fun of it. I was leading people away. And then in... So he put you in charge and then you're like, this is rejection? No. Yeah, that's how I took it. Because I took... Because <laughs> what, what that meant to me is, hey, I'm not going to spend this time with you anymore. Oh, okay, okay, okay. So, like, you weren't important enough to spend time with... Yeah, and, and I wasn't consciously thinking those thoughts then. Yeah, I just course. thought, man, I can't do this on my own. Yeah, you're so just you, you were looking for away. someone to, you know, be kind of like a father figure. Yes, for so, sure. So, like, you, you grew up without a dad, and how did that mold and shape your life? Like, were you always consistently, like, did you respect authority more, or did you, like... Lack in the respect. Oh man, I had a definite lack and distrust for authority. Did not especially respect men. authority, uh, especially men. And and my grandfather, God bless him, he's saved now. Um, growing up in his house, he comes from an abusive family, mm-hmm. and he was abusive to my mom and his kids. So when I came, he wasn't abusive anymore physically, but he did not know how to love. He was verbally abusive. So if I would try to do something, he would call me stupid. He would say I'm an idiot. He would like get so angry at me being around. This was on your mom's side? It was on my mom's side. That's when I was like a small child that I just had this fear of I'm not good enough. I can't do anything good enough. And um, And you never met any of your dad's family. He just like disappeared. You never saw him again. Yeah, he disappeared, which later I found out he moved to some part of Florida and joined like this Christian cult like... What? Yeah, like they didn't celebrate birthdays and stuff. They didn't celebrate holidays, and he couldn't like contact outside family and stuff. So I didn't hear from him for like. Have you heard from him since? Yes. Okay. Well, before we get there, so um, okay, so now you're you you've moved past uh, middle school and you become like rebellious against your church. Um, at what point did you like start getting into drugs or sex? Were you having sex or anything like that? No, so I, I wasn't doing anything like that. I was trying to um, <laughs> <laughs> as a seventh and eighth grader, but it wasn't happening. Um, but in ninth grade, my mom let me go to public school. Okay. So this is the first time I've ever been. No, in sixth grade, I was in public school. So this was the first time I had been back in public school. But at this point, I knew a lot of people because of that kind of revival that happened in the okay. youth. Wait, I thought you said you were homeschooled in sixth grade. I was. Yeah, yeah. I was, I was in school and then you got in sixth back. grade, and they took me out because I was getting fights. And then you got back in. In ninth grade, in they ninth put me grade. back okay. in high school. And um, so I went back to high school. And I knew a lot of people, and I got to be really popular because I just knew so many people from different schools. In Georgia. In Georgia. And because of my upbringing, I was friends with all of the black people. Mm -hmm. Um, But now I was friends with all of the white people, so I just knew everybody. Okay. And um, everybody was so surprised, like, you don't smoke? You don't drink? Mm -hmm. Because I was, like, super, uh, I would interrupt the classes. I was super funny, like... So they're like, man, you act like you're high now. Like, I can't imagine if you smoked. And I was like, no, I don't do that. I don't do that. People used to tell me that growing up, too. Yeah? They, because I was crazy. Like, I was, like, <laughs> annoying. So I was like, they're like, oh, what, what would it be like if you smoked, or like, marijuana or something? I'd be like, oh, my gosh. Like, I don't even know what that'd be like. Like, if I'm already disruptive as it is, like, oh, my goodness. But anyways. <laughs> so, so the end of ninth grade, um, I joined the football team, and I'm on the JV team and going to practices. So then I start hanging out more with that crowd, and they invite me to a party. And at the party, like, it's at somebody's house. Um, the mom just, like, doesn't care. I had never been, like, hanging out at somebody's house where the – because my mom was, like, a Christian. Like, you can't watch certain shows. You can't, you can't have an Xbox. Like, you can't play video games. And uh, that's really good, though. Yeah, I know. Uh, but she, this mom was like, "Yeah, y'all can have beer, you can have alcohol." And we got drunk, and like we were hooking up with girls and stuff. And I yeah. was like, "Man, 
alcohol is amazing. Like, yeah, this this is this is like the truth. Like, I'm quitting. The, I'm not even going to football practice in the morning. Like, let's yeah. go party again. It was exciting for you. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, it, it was super exciting because in that environment, I'm not feeling the pain. I'm not feeling like myself, which I hate myself. Mm-hmm. Um, so now I'm this different person. Girls are showing me attention, me not knowing, oh, they hate themselves too. Yeah. Um, so it just felt like, man, this is the answer to life. Mm. And then so that summer, one of our friends got some marijuana. We smoked weed. And we were like, man, like drugs is like the best mm. thing in the world. <laughs> Like, oh my god! You were never worried about like getting hooked on it or nothing like that? No, I've always been extreme. I was hooked immediately, and yeah. I wanted to be hooked. Like, Oh, wow. Give it to me all the time. Like, as soon wow. as we get up, let's get it. Like, you didn't feel any conviction like from church or anything? You were just like, no, I don't care. This feels good. <laughs> I felt no conviction. and Because um, it's funny, because for me, like, I didn't, like, I was always so cautious with drugs and everything, even like my sexuality and everything, exploring that. Like, I was always so convicted. Like, I was like, I'm not doing right. Like, it was like an internal mind thing. Mm-hmm. So I never I never got into drugs or anything because I was like, no, I, I can't do that. Like, I can mm-hmm. do everything but that. Like, <laughs> no, at this point, like, I was reasoning, like, I would even argue with my mom and I would argue with people and I'd say, look, I didn't ask to be created. Mm-hmm. Like, F God. Mm-hmm. Like, I didn't ask to be here. I don't want to be here. I'm not worried about disappointing him. I'm disappointed in him. I can't believe he made me. Oh, wow. Okay, you know? okay. So you were like, you had been seeing God kind of like the father that rejected you as, okay, as opposed to like me. Like, when I would see God, I would see God as a way of um, like someone who was loving, like after me, caring for me, like no matter what. Mm-hmm. But it was almost like I couldn't understand him. So it was like a lack of understanding of like who he mm-hmm. was, mm-hmm. but you were seeing God as like what you have seen in your life, your experience was, it was like your dad almost. Well, there was like a part because there was a part of me that every night, even through the stage, I would, you know, say a prayer before I went to sleep and ask her forgiveness for my sins. I would listen to preaching cassettes on repeat as I went to sleep. I, I would read the Bible sometimes. There's part that I knew about Jesus and I knew that he was love. But then whenever there was like a, a responsibility put on that or someone tried to convict me, mm-hmm. um, I, I guess I almost had a codependence with my mom growing up mm-hmm. because uh, when we moved in with my grandparents, she was more of like a, almost like a sister and a mother. Mm-hmm. And okay. I think she felt guilty that my dad wasn't there. Mm-hmm. So I would take advantage of her. I had this codependent thing. So I would kind of put that on God of like, yes, he takes care of me, loves me, but it's his fault. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess yes. I, yeah. that might sound complicated, but I think that's really what it. No, yeah, what definitely it was. very different. They're very different ideas, like growing up from me to you, which is very, very. I've never heard like that side before, which is really cool. So okay, so then you got into drugs, and then what led you out onto the streets? Like what led you into like? Okay, so where you were going. <laughs> so there, I I take back something I said a few minutes ago. There was mm-hmm. a little bit of caution. The first time we smoked weed, we were at my friend's house. We had like a group of friends that said, "Okay, we're gonna smoke weed, guys, but we are never going to do cocaine. Okay, we're never going to do pills, right, guys? Let's solemnly swear. Yep, we are never going to do that. Okay, you guys are like. How old are you in ninth grade? Like 15. 15? Oh my goodness. And uh, so we start smoking and it just takes over like smoking, drinking, smoking, drinking. Yeah. And um, my my mom had spyware on our computer. <laughs> right? Okay. So so she, I come home one day and she's like, oh, what have you been doing? So, mm-hmm. Oh, nothing. We're just hanging out at Tyler's house. Like, you know, nothing much. And she's like, well, like, look what I said. You're asking about, like, buying weed and, like, doing all this stuff. And I was like, oh, my gosh. On Google? <laughs> on, on uh, like, that was back in the uh, MySpace. <laughs> <laughs> MySpace messages. I'm so glad that I grew up, like, Latino. My parents didn't have any idea how to work a computer. So I could do whatever I wanted. But, like, we didn't get computers till we were, like, I don't even know. Like, I think I was like out of high school already. Like, I did right. not have a computer. Yeah, we had we had one computer, so it was easy to put the spyware. This is before iPhones and stuff. And uh, oh yeah, I think we had one. We had one like family computer. <laughs> yes, yes. Such a weird, like, so weird I'm trying days. to make drug deals on this family computer, <laughs> and she has spyware on the computer. And so she grounds me, right? Mm-hmm. And I had this anger at my mom because she would ground me, and not give me a date of when I'm not grounded anymore. 
Okay. Which I hated being at home. Mm. So it was like my only escape was going to a friend's house on the weekend. And so when she would do that, it would be like this tormenting, like angry thing. Um, so I knew this was going to be like a long time of this grounding. Like I wasn't going to hear when I could get out. So at that point, my dad contacts, makes contact with me. Mm. And he's living in Denver, Colorado. Okay. And he finds out and he says to me, son, I heard that you've been smoking weed and stuff. Um, I was like, yeah. He was like, um, well, you know what? I smoke weed too. <laughs> Father of the year. Yeah. <laughs> Abandons his child, <laughs> then encourages drug use. And, and he, that was in the beginning where um, he was a medical marijuana, like, yeah. Um, grower and like dispenser oh yeah yeah in so Denver. yeah so that was like when that was first legal there and he was like on the cutting edge of that and he was like you know i understand you your mom doesn't understand you you know the religious church don't understand you you know but you're my son i understand you like you know it's okay if you were here with me you know i'd let you smoke in the house because i'd rather you get high here than like out there and dangerous <laughs> and stuff and, you know, at 15, I was like, man, this sounds like the gospel. Yeah. Like this, this. Were you like, Dad, can I come live with you? <laughs> yes, because he, he, he was like, you know, you could come stay with me. You could smoke in the house. Like, it wouldn't be a big deal. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go live with him. And then at Christmas time, I'll just come back and I won't be grounded anymore. Like, okay. well, I'll escape this whole system. Okay. So I go out there. When I get off the plane, he gives me this edible weed candies. Oh and we start God. smoking in the car. And it's medical grade marijuana. So I've never had anything like this. I'm just like. This is insane. Your, your father is ins <laughs> yes. insane. I'm sorry. <laughs> Give me these little green roses and said, here, eat this. And uh, just high because in the medical marijuana community. So he's growing it in our house, teaching me how to grow it. Like that's my chores is like we're going to water the plants we're gonna... did your mom know about this no she had oh, no clue goodness. she had no it's clue like having fun up there <laughs> yeah i'm having a great time <laughs> yes yes and so uh up there this gets crazy and then he's he also has like extreme like injuries so he's taking pain pills and drinking and so he's sharing that stuff too uh -huh. so i would wake up in the morning we would smoke a bowl together we would take a couple shots of whiskey together. Uh, he maybe would give me a pill. Mm -hmm. And then we would he drop me off at school like that. Right? And um, at school, I was like, man, like, F school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, like, I'm going to skip school. And in, in Colorado, drugs are so prevalent because marijuana is not even, like, criminalized there. It's like, yeah. whatever. So Yeah, I know. Everyone's doing drugs. It's like a completely different culture. And so I just get like sucked up into that. And um, I don't come back in December. Um, I stay up there. It gets worse and worse. I become an alcoholic. Um, I get introduced to painkillers. How many years? Just one year. Just one year up there. But at every day, all day, all the time. Did you do anything else like cocaine or like math or anything up um, there? Right before I left. Um, and was your dad doing any of that stuff? No, he wasn't doing meth or cocaine and stuff. It was just the, the pain pills like the, the methadone and the Oxycontin okay. and stuff like that and okay. smoking and the alcohol. But then the last night I left because I left because we got arrested. Um, the drug task force came in. They said, man, you got this whole grow operation here. And medical marijuana was still new then wow so you saying I have a paper that says I can grow it. The police are like, OK, well, you're going to go downtown like we don't you don't do this and mm. uh so when we got arrested it was like hey mom um my family's in jail <laughs> can you come yeah. get me and she was like what they, they didn't put you in jail there no just... i did too okay but um i was a minor and stuff so yeah. just with a parent signature i got out okay and uh they were like my mom was like what in the world so she came and she got you and then and then you went back to florida no, I went to Georgia because we lived in Georgia. Sorry. But right before I left, my dad gave me some like Molly, like some like uh, MDMA cut with like meth, and we Why? had like tried that one night. He just for fun. He's just yeah. like here. <laughs> yeah, because because he was hanging out with these these guys that were in like a rock band, and they were doing. It, he was like, you could have some. My goodness. So I got introduced to that right before we left, and then we came back, and then 
I was like the drug expert. My friends were like smoking weed and stuff. And I was yeah. like, man, y'all have no idea about You're drugs. You're like, I grew weed. Like, yeah. I like have MDMA. <laughs> yes. You know what it's called? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then skipping forward a little bit, um, you started to, what did you, what did you start to do? Like, um, I, I got back and it was so different because with my father, drugs were available at all times. It was a way of life. Like, if we needed dinner, we'd get dinner and we needed weed. So we were always buying weed. We always had it. Um, but when I came back, I came to a Christian home. Nobody had it. Of course. <laughs> Nobody had it. So um, that was the time where um, cough medicine got really popular because of like the rap music and Lil Wayne and stuff like yeah. that. So I tried cough medicine. Somebody gave me cough medicine. And it, this was stuff that you can just go to the grocery store and get cough yeah. medicine. And cough medicine gets you really high, and it lasts for like eight hours at a time. Did not know that. So I started doing cough medicine all day, every day. So I would go to the grocery store. Um, I would steal multiple bottles, and I would just take them. Oh, wow. And I got addicted to cold medicine, which it like destroys your nervous system, your your liver. And it's, it's very like um, it slows your heart, and it makes you like... The more you take it, the more messed up your imagination gets and you start like tripping more and more and more. And that's when things got like dark, mm. you know, um, that's when things. And got... you were still in school. Yeah, I, I was still in school. But when I went to school and my mom was trying to discipline me and the school was trying to discipline me, it was like I was smoking cigarettes on campus. And like they were like, you can't do that here. I was like, call my mom, whatever. I'm smoking. And uh like, they, they couldn't do anything. My mom would try to ground me. I would say... And you weren't going to church during this time? <clears throat> no, sir. So, no more church? <laughs> the church where that revival happened closed down. Okay. The pastor got into, like, a divorce. Got, he got addicted to painkillers. He got in, like, a tragic car accident, almost died. The whole church closed down. Wow. So, it was just like, man, God sucks. Wow. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. You were not in a good place. Okay, so then... Um, <clears throat> going into like how did you get into like gangs how did you get into like all that so like you know if you've ever been in drug culture um <clears throat> when you first start doing more drugs and hanging around people you um they offer it for free they're like oh come with us it's for free when you get hooked on it it's no longer free hmm. <laughs> right so when i first came back i had like a uh lip ring and I was super skinny and I was like, I was really um, like worked out a lot and I had this great hair and, and I was wearing skinny jeans. That was when skinny jeans were new. No one wore them. So I was like a, like a, a Jonah's brother, like a Jonah's brother. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and so I was like really popular and rebellion's cool in high school. So I was getting invited everywhere. Like here's drugs, here's drugs. Hey, we're doing pills. You want to start taking pills? You want to start doing coke uh, you want to start smoking i was doing all of that but then with the cold medicine and stuff i was high all the time and people were like man that's not, what you're doing is not fun what you're doing is like sad mm -hmm. and i started like gaining this reputation as like that kid that throws up at parties and stuff they're like because because wow. cold medicine makes you just throw up and stuff okay and so no one wanted to give me drugs then nobody wanted to hang out so i was like man how am i gonna like keep doing what i'm doing so then I started skipping school, going to the neighborhood right next to the school where all the gangs are, where mm -hmm. people are selling drugs, and just started like stealing and trying to sell drugs, selling weed, selling pills, robbing people that would come into that neighborhood looking for drugs. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's where I got involved in the gangs and stuff and started mm -hmm. going to jail. Wow. Mm -hmm. and what was the whole point of the, the gangs? Like, it was just to sell drugs or it was to create violence or community or what? Gangs, because of what was happening in the rap music, gangs were like this, like, fad that yeah. were going on at that time. Because yeah. this is like 2008. Yeah. You know, this is like, everyone wanted to be in a gang. Um, people were there. That there was like guns involved? Yeah, people had guns and stuff. It wasn't like... Um, a lot of like this gang versus that gang, a lot of shootings. That there was some of that, but it was more, hey, we're in a gang, so we're selling drugs together and we're robbing people. Like okay. if we don't have money or something, we're gonna steal from these people, we're gonna So it was mostly about drugs. Yeah. It was okay. mostly about drugs. Interesting. Especially Did you me. guys have like a like a meeting place? Like it was like <laughs> No, because um, I remember that you mentioned like the reason like 
uh, you got into church. Well, that when when you first noticed Christianity was because of, well, it was mostly because like people in Christianity were well, people in gangs were doing a better job at being like a community the maker, yeah. than like people in uh, Christianity. Yes. And that's what it was like in, in your gangs? Yeah, it was. So in the neighborhood, and just like churches, you ever been to churches where it's like, man, this is not real? And the church is like, oh, man, this is real? Yeah. So in gangs, there's like, man, this group of people is not real? Man, mm-hmm. this group of people is real. Yeah. Um, so at first, you're around the real people, but I'm fitting in with the not real people. But the real people saw how, like, unflinching I was, how, like, man, I'm ready to fight. I'm ready to do whatever. So then um, they started embracing me, right? Mm -hmm. And um, when I started getting involved with the real people, they started really discipling me. Like, you would hang around. They teach you, like... Were they older, the same age? Like, were there any, like, kind of, like, father figure that you looked up to? The ones that I was hanging out with, um, there was they were a little bit older, like, maybe two years older. Um, But they had just moved from another state where the gang thing was huge. Mm -hmm. And they had been around the older people, but... They were just more confident. They were more, like, respected and stuff. So I just, like, looked at, like, that big brother kind of father figure, even though they were the same age, just okay. complete lost. And then I went to prison, and then the, the people that I was really getting close with in the gang with there, they were in prison with me. And then it took a whole new, like, now What'd we're What did you go to prison for? Uh, burglary. Burglary. Interesting. Burglary. Like from a house, from a car? From a house. Oh my gosh, just like broke into a house. Oh yeah, I was stealing from houses all the time. That's and crazy. I had, one time my parents went out for Christmas, I had broke into their house and stole all my little sister's stuff. I stole my you mom's You broke into jewelry. your own house? Bro- I stole from them. Um, I Couldn't stole... you just like, it's your house? <laughs> just no, I wasn't living there. <laughs> okay. No, my, my oh, the, I didn't tell you that. Um, when I started doing drugs okay. and I came back, um, my mom kicked me out. Oh, okay. She was not having it. She was like, you're either going to do, like, stop. So then where were you sleeping? I, I was, um, I met some friends and, um. In the gangs and stuff. In in the gangs and even outside the gangs of like, oh, you could stay here or you could stay here. And you weren't going to school anymore, obviously, after that, right? No, I would show up to school and eat lunch. <laughs> it was free yeah it was, it was free and then I would leave. Like, this is the guy who like comes and eat, eats lunch <laughs> yeah and they would like oh you're gonna get in trouble or like you know and I'd be like alright call my mom like, oh my god <laughs> wow that's crazy and your mom just didn't care like she was just like no you're... she cared a lot she was heartbroken okay. Okay. Um, but she didn't want to enable me wow okay that's difficult that's a difficult choice to make my parents are very like they were, even even through all my craziness, they would still hold on to me. Like they just like they would call they would say, Oh, we're gonna call the cops, we're gonna call the cops. So I would always calm down after that, but I guess for you it's like I did not calm down. Yeah. You're like, Nope. <laughs> Alright, I'm I'm running away for calling the cops. Yeah, my mom she would come by periodically and buy me groceries. Or if I would have ever changed, she would have embraced me back right yeah. away. But I just never changed. So then okay, so then you, you get arrested, you go to jail. Um, and then that's when you hear about Jesus. Like, how did you hear about Jesus? No, the first time I'm in prison, I just got worse in the gangs because okay. in prison, gangs are a really big deal. Mm-hmm. And the gang that I was in, it's the biggest African American gang in the country. Wow! It almost runs almost every prison. And then there's you. <laughs> yes, and, and then I'm in this gang, and um, so again to fit in there in that gang. Um, I had to be more controversial than everybody. I had to prove myself to my gang, outside the gang. And um, because of the nature of burglary in Georgia, it's Mm -hmm. a violent crime. So when I went to prison, I'm in the same section with people that have life. Murderers, um, rapists, right? And I'm only in there for a year. And I'm with these people. (laughs) How was that like for you? It was crazy, man. Were you scared? When I first went to prison, I was scared out of my mind. Because they tell you in jail, oh, your gang that you're in is not real. Like, they're going to test you when you go to prison. And it's mm-hmm. you're going to find out. And I was like, whatever. I'm going to go. Let's let's test it. But when I got to prison, I was like, oh, my gosh. This is horrifying. <laughs> what, and you no longer had the drugs, obviously. Right. No longer had the drugs. So it was all coming to, like, a crashing course. Okay. So tell me about, like, the second time. Because we're almost up out of time. But the second time that you went to jail, mm-hmm. how did you hear about Jesus? So all the seeds, because you know the word says the, the, the word of God, the seed, is incorruptible. 
Mm -hmm. So all that time that you're hearing the word, all that time that you're not believing it, the seed is going into your heart and it's incorruptible. And the seeds are being watered. I'm encountering Christians while I'm locked up. I'm having dreams. Um, I actually was hearing preaching from Joseph Prince. And when I was in jail one time, that was watering the seeds. Um, but I had this awakening. I was watching a movie. Um, and at this point, I was so twisted. I was like converting people out of Christianity. I was practicing witchcraft a little bit at this point. I was like, I was crazy, man. And wow. uh, I felt this. I felt love. I saw a movie, somebody did something out of compassion for somebody else. In the movie? In the movie. Okay. And I felt like, you know, that tingling, like that presence of the Holy Spirit? Like yeah. I felt that and I was like, man, what the heck is this? Right? Interesting. Okay. This is something to live for. So I started seeking that out. I started reading the Quran and I was really practicing the Quran. I was praying five times a day. I was doing the washings. I was trying to learn Arabic, but I was mixing all the religions together. And I'm kind of making my own, you know, it's like the Oprah gospel. Like, I yeah. was mixing them and I was like gathering followers in the prison. I was teaching them like, you know, this is all the same thing. That's crazy. Um, yeah. <laughs> and uh, and what else? Um, this guy, he, he spoke to me. I was arguing with this guy because I loved arguing the Bible because I grew up in church. Hmm. So I could always like, you yeah. know, it's not about the law. It's the spirit or stuff and just yeah. try to win arguments. And I was arguing with this guy and he said... Have you, um, you believe in Jesus? I said, yeah, I believe in Jesus. He said, have you been baptized? I said, yeah, I've been baptized with the water and the fire, like the Holy Spirit and the water. He said, really, you've been baptized? And I felt this conviction of the Holy Spirit. And I looked down at Shane. I said, yeah, I have. I have been. In all these years of this relationship with Jesus that I had, this this codependent blaming him but receiving his love and mm -hmm. and praying to him at night but denying him at day it all came crashing on me that yeah i do know him i do know him and um so i got down on my knees one night and um you know i just prayed to god i said god if you're real i want to know you mm -hmm. you know so if your name's allah or jehovah or buddha because at this point i was just thinking allah was just the newest testament of the same god course you know it, so whatever if if you're real or you're just aliens and none of these are completely the truth if there's a, <laughs> a name that's never been heard i want to know you that's so similar to like the prayer that i did as well like i was like i knew jesus but then i was at, at a point in my life like i was so desperate like i was like i was like god just show me like what are you like <laughs> who are you like are you really jesus like are you Allah? Like, what are you? I want to know. And and he proved it to me. But anyways, how did he prove it to you? Yes. So um, I was there on my knees in a cell and I heard that small, still voice, man. Like Elijah, the small, still voice came to me and said, my name is Jesus. And I just broke, like broke. I felt this this wave of electricity, like this tingling go all throughout my body. And it and it, it was through my chest and my legs and my arms. And it felt like when I used to smoke meth. Because right? wow. at this point, I was doing every drug. and But it was clean and it was pure. And I was free. Like, I was bawling. And I just felt free for the first time in my life. And I gave him everything, man. Like, I, di I didn't even have words to say. But in that moment, mm -hmm. like, I gave it. Which it wasn't hard because I didn't have much to give, right? Mm -hmm. But I gave him everything. I gave yeah. him all of myself. And, like, from the next day, I was a new creation. Like, mm -hmm. the guards, the inmates were like... Buffington, are you like, are you trying to like pull a mind game on us? Like, who are you? Mm -hmm. Like, what are you? Are you like happy or are you like? Um, I was, I was trying to live righteous. Mm -hmm. So I stopped cursing. I stopped stealing. I stopped arguing. I stopped manipulating. Cause I was like mm -hmm. that second time in prison, I had like caused a riot. I had like, I, I was doing like crazy stuff. So I was like respectful to authority. Yeah. I was like obeying. I was, um. Like people thought I was playing a mind trick on them. Wow. So then, so then you you left prison. Uh, how long were you in it for that term? That second time I was in prison, it was for like a year. So the first time was a year and a half. Second time was a year. But I got saved towards the end. So okay. for a few months, and then I get out and I come down here to Florida. Okay. And uh, like what we were saying, there's not much of a future for a high school dropout with convicted felonies. Like to this day, I couldn't get a job at McDonald's because wow. of my felony record. Wow. Um, like I can't be an Uber driver. I can't do anything. Like it's wow. just the gospel or nothing. And yeah. so I started going to church seven days a week. I was like, man, I'm in the house of the Lord. Seek first the kingdom of God. All these things will be added to you. 
Um, my bishop told me to get involved with the youth. Um, mm. I started being a youth leader. I got ordained, became a pastor, a youth pastor. Um, so many miraculous provisions. I've, I've had three cars just given to me by people saying, hey, God told me to give you my car. Wow. Um, people just opening up doors. And, and now three years ago in April, April's our three-year anniversary. We launched our own church here in Hollywood, mm -hmm. and it's just been the gospel or bust, man. That's amazing. I mean, I'm, I'm so glad. Like, it, it just shows like when your story and everything that you say, like how much you've changed. I, I'm, I'm like looking at you. Like, I can't even imagine that person. And that's crazy. I mean, that is the true gospel right there. That is like the power. I like, 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 bam! That's the power of lifestyle, baby. You know, like, yeah. it's like, bam! That's the power of the Holy Spirit, baby. Yes. And I love hearing that, and I love hearing that story. So, um, yeah, that is Jared's story. He's a pastor at Kingdom Come. I'm so glad to have you on once again, Jared. Before we go, um, I just want to close it out with a prayer. Um, and I'll, I'll do the prayer for anybody out there who's struggling with addiction, who's struggling with drug abuse or rejection from their father, you know, just come to believe in, in Jared's story. Like if God can transform his life, can use him as a vessel, then he can do the same for you. It doesn't matter if you're in jail. It doesn't matter if you're knee deep in cocaine or whatever, methamphetamine, you know, just come to Jesus, come to know that he is the one true God and the one person who can love you above all else. Um, so God, thank you so much for this amazing, wonderful, beautiful day. Thank you for the opportunity to have this podcast and to be able to sh share your testimonies of what you do in people's lives. We pray that every single person that is listening to this podcast, Lord God, that you can touch them emotionally and, and let them know who you are and that you are truly God, the one and the only Lord God, and that you're alive and that you want to know them, Lord God. Set them free. Set the captives free. In Jesus' name we pray. So any last words, Jared? <laughs> Man, uh, the one-step program of the Holy Spirit is for everybody. Just give him everything and he will give you everything. That's amazing. I'm so happy to hear that. All right, guys, I hope you have a beautiful, awesome day. And, and just enjoy it. Enjoy life. <laughs>